next up, we're going to talk about IPNI and what it actually is. Uh, this is a acronym that came up a number of times yesterday uh, in uh, data transfer track, uh, in the opening talks. Uh, it is not something new. I'm, uh, the chances are you have already heard about it. It's just a bit of rename and a bit of restructuring, which uh, I thought it deserves a separate talk uh, to crystallize uh, what is a protocol, uh, increasingly becoming a protocol, and what is an implementation. So I put together this talk to kind of sort of talk about that specific um, um, protocol versus its implementations. Uh, what are plans in terms of protocol perspective? Uh, and then uh, walk you through probably the most developed instance of IPNI, which is SID.contact that comes after that. So with that in mind, uh, let's get started. What is IPNI? It's an alternative routing system uh, which is designed to provide CIDs by the billion, by the bucket load, <laughs> while maintaining sub uh, 10 millisecond latency-ish. Uh, it is a protocol that is totally different from the way by which DHT, for example, advertises content and looks up information. And it makes very distinct design decisions to make this statement uh, become true. Uh, because the fact remains that right now, we cannot provide content at the rate that is being generated uh, in, in, in the DHT. So we need some sort of other mechanism to enable implementers, enable people that are building stuff on top of this uh, simple yet extremely powerful ecosystem we call content address data uh, to find their information. And that's where IPNI comes in. So why is it needed? I sort of touched on that a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, you know, it, 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 we really need to understand why we need something like IPNI when there's already a, a writing system. As I touched on in my opening talk, there is a, a gap in the networks, right? The, there was a gap in the networks. There was Filecoin and there was IPFS. The amount of information on Filecoin is significantly larger than the amount of uh, information in IPFS. Even ignoring that, in the IPFS world, we see sort of optimizations that are a result of a uh, routing system not sort of being able to handle it, uh, which is, I'm only going to advertise my root CID, for example. I'm not going to advertise the rest of it. So we, we are starting to see this type of optimization on the IPFS world. Uh, which is pragmatic, but really in the long run is going to impact the user experience and it's going to impact this idea of parallelism when it comes to retrieval, the idea of replication, the idea of caching. It has a huge ripple effect if we don't provide alternatives that truly allow us to advertise all the CIDs. And, uh, you know, so, so it is pretty important. Large-scale content providers have totally different requirements than me running an IPFS node on my laptop, traveling to work on, on, the, uh, on the train and back. Their addresses might change. Um, the the large-scale large uh, content providers, the, they, they do not want to re-advertise content every time they redeploy a node, for example. right? They want to be able to horizontally scale as the uh, traffic for looking up information goes up and down because they want to be as efficient as possible, both in terms of uh, performance as well as cost. And uh, at the same time, they want to provide um, fast lookup. And when we're talking about content address data and content address data, looking up content address data, we're not really talking about matching the Web2 performance. We absolutely talk about uh, smashing it. Because when we are talking about a peer-to-peer -peer network, on the paper, it has to be much, much faster than the centralized network. So what can we do to enable this type of interaction? Right? And the last one, but not least, let's ignore 
uh, scaling issues with uh, existing content routing systems. Let's, uh, let's assume that the cost of connection is zero and we have unlimited connections to everybody. We are talking about, uh, right now we, we have about 10 to the 12 number of CIDs, right? That's, that's in trillions. Where we wanna get to is 10 to the 15, right? Two orders of magnitude larger than that. Even at 10 to the 12, if we do the rough calculation uh, with the size of network that we have now, which is about 20,000 nodes-ish, assuming all of them are well-connected and you know, well-behaved, we're talking about gigabytes of data stored on each of these nodes for content routing alone. And as a person who is running IPFS on his machine on the way to work, sitting on a train, that's a bit of a, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to do this, right? So, like, this is, this is another motivation here. The, the other one is um, the, the storage space, the, the cost of storage keeps going down. So, if we have an alternative solution that just has a simple machine, has a simple protocol, connects terabytes of data to this server-like thing, and, uh, you know, hopefully over time, this is not going to cost as much uh, running because storage prices keep going down. And what we can do when the storage prices go down means we can reduce this notion of having to trust a central party uh, by simply replicating the data. Uh, so there are, there are ways there. So uh, just to backtrack, there's a few design decisions here. The need to enable uh, content routing for the rate of growth in, in content addressable data the need for faster uh, lookup, the need for flexibility on how you handle this content address data for the large scale providers that have totally different requirements than a uh, typical you know, small node uh, in an IPFS network. And more importantly, as the storage gets cheaper, we can replicate these and reduce this notion of single point of trust, which is something that we all strive for in this community. So that is why IPNI exists. Uh, there's been a number of words in the, in the past year or so that sort of used for ex uh, explaining IPNI or pointing at IPNI interchangeably. I wanted to clarify that a little bit. So IPNI really isn't network indexer. IPNI isn't a stored index, nor c.contact, nor an index provider. Great, a lot of information, but what is it really? So if I, if I want to restructure this, I wanna say that all these things are members of IPNI. So if you can think of network indexers as the uh, serving nodes in the IPNI ecosystem, uh, these are the nodes that are big nodes with lots of storage attached and their job is to just provide a lookup fast and ingest by the bucket load. Store the index is just an implementation and hopefully not the only one soon, uh, of index uh, providers. This is the server-side implementation. Sid.contact, we're gonna cover that in the next talk in a minute. Uh, and index providers. Index providers are just nodes that are implementing the protocol by which uh, to provide information into the uh, IPNI. So in, in the Kubo world, you have the uh, DHT client, for example, or its extensions that Guy kindly uh, covered for us today. Uh, and in the IPNI node, uh, IPNI world, you have the index providers, which are uh, following a specific protocol in order to advertise content into the uh, interplanetary network indexer. What does the protocol look like? So let, let's, let's dive a little bit deeper. We've got indexer nodes in the middle that are ingesting advertisements. The story begins on the left-hand side where you have the index providers that are structuring their data in a specific way that is made to be super efficient for uh, ingestion, super efficient for change, may it be address, may it be retrieval protocol, and, uh, um, and may it be change in the subset of CIDs that are provided. Right? So this is important, we'll we get back to that in a minute. And then these index providers, once they structure the data into this 
special way, uh, they make an announcement to the network to say, hey, I have something. That announcement is just a message to say, there is something new, come get it. Right? That's totally different from the way that uh, DHT works. Right? So here you have this triggered passive uh, interaction. I trigger something, and the network indexer comes and gets it at its own leisure, wherever uh, it sees fit. So then once the announcements are published into a network or explicitly, uh, network indexers are going to reach to the provider, uh, assuming they haven't seen the advertisement before, and they say, give me the data. They get the data, they structure it in a two-layer um, data store. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit uh, some more. And then expose a simple REST API, which is just get, CID, or multi-hash. Uh, you call this endpoint and you get the results back. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about that in, uh, structure on the left because I think it's important to understand why and how it is different from the DHT. And then I'm going to talk internally about uh, how this is structured inside the network indexer, though outside the specification, this is outside the specification, but you know, this is typically how we see the data being structured on the nodes for scalability reasons. So on the left-hand side, the structure by which the content is advertised by the providers is, looks a lot like a blockchain. You have an advertisement, uh, which is a root node. That's a, that advertisement has very simple fields like what is the peer ID, what is the address, um, uh, information about how the data can be retrieved, which is a new thing that doesn't exist in DHT. And then it has a pointer or a link to a series of chunks or entry chunks which actually contain the multi-hashes themselves. This entire structure is IPLD data. Right? So we, we are using content address uh, uh, representation for advertising the content address information. Right? And uh, I think that is quite nice because just having the advertisements as content address data just allows you to reuse the existing ecosystem for looking up other things, which you know, we'll talk about it, uh, uh, later a little bit, uh, but, but the, just I, I want you to imagine looking up other um, copies of an advertisement across uh, using the same content address network that enables looking up the information in the first place. I think there's something beautiful about that, right? Uh, the advertisements themse themselves never advert, never contain removal, uh, 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 the, the, never directly contain the entries that are removed from the chain. Uh, that is an important optimization. So if I have advertised millions of multi-hashes for me to say, I no longer have this, this is a very small uh, data, very small advertisement just to say, you know, the things that I told you in the past with this ID, scratch them don't have them anymore, right? You never republish uh, multi-hashes, right? You never republish any of these entries. If you want to change addresses from provider's perspective, again, this is a single advertisement that just changes the address. You literally publish a new thing, you say, I changed the address, that's it. Address gets changed for all the advertisements that happened in the past. There is another mechanism which we call uh, extended providers which allows you to have a cluster of nodes that are providing the same information. This is typical of a large-scale content provider. Right? And have a way of conveying that through advertisements to say, you know all the advertisements that I've published in the past, right? now I have three nodes in front of it that serve the same data. Again, you do not publish all the multi-hashes again. All you're doing is please extend the addresses by which this can be uh, retrieved by these extra nodes. And this is, this is really nice, right? So far, I think this is probably as efficient as you can get when it comes to advertising content. Um, the one thing I wanted to cover here, yeah, well, we can get back to it. On, on the indexer side, uh, this passive fetching allows the indexers to identify or, or uh, think about what information they have before they reach out to the client. Because remember, all of this is content address data. Right? What we're exchanging is CIDs and DAGs here. Right? 
CIDs are pointing to immutable data. Network indexer can see whether a CID has been seen before or not. Right? And therefore, it does not need to reach out and uh, fetch data every time. Right? So what does that really mean in practice? Ah, it, it means great things. An advertisement could be pointing to an entry that has been published weeks before. And there is a way for indexers to infer that. So you, you will never have to get the same data twice. Right? That's pretty nice. On the indexer side, the data is structured in such a way that it is optimized for changes in the, in the information that we store for each of these records. And by changes, I mean things like the address changes, the retrieval, ad, uh, retrieval um, uh, protocols, and so on that I touched on earlier. And that is done simply by having a foreign key-like mechanism, if you like, in, in, in the RDBS, RDBS uh, relational database design. So what we have is a multi-hash that points to something that remains constant. And then that constant thing then points to other things that may change all the time. And that then allows us to efficiently handle things like change of uh, protocol as well as change of addresses. Uh, the thing that I wanted to talk about that I couldn't remember earlier, advertisements are chained together and signed at every step of the way. That allows the whole ecosystem to uh, prove that a peer indeed claimed to provide a multi-hash because everything is signed here. Right? And this is a small window into a whole body of work that we haven't even started scratching the surface of, and that is reputation. Right there, you have a way by which you can prove that you told me you have this information, right? Where is it? Because you have an advertise that is removed, and, uh, removed right? Imagine, like a scenario, some, some node that just publishes stuff, right? And this is the concept of accountability that is built into the advertisement uh, chain, typical of a blockchain-like data structure. So the most recent extensions to the IPNI protocol, remember this talk is going to only talk about the protocol itself. We're going to dive into the implementation in a bit. Extended provider families. I touched on that a little bit earlier. If you're a large-scale provider and you're providing information across multiple nodes, typical setup in, in a large-scale provider, right? these nodes are probably elastic. They go uh, small and they go big. More importantly, the protocols by which the data could be retrieved might change over time. Today, you might be supporting BitSwap. Tomorrow, you, might, you want to support uh, GraphSync. The day after Bao, the day after tomorrow, instead your favorite protocol here, right? Should you really have to re-advertise all your content every time you change the protocol? Really not, right? So that's where IPNI has built-in levers to allow you to really express this. And uh, these two levers are kind of combined together uh, in both in terms of the node addresses as well as the protocols over which they can be retrieved. Uh, a really good example of this being used today uh, is Boost. Boost is a new uh, uh, Filecoin market implementation which offers extensions in terms of uh, retrieval of data as well as much, much simpler interface to interact with the data. Uh, Boost did not. Sub Boost today supports BitSwap, supports HTTP. I think it's in the making, almost there. Uh, from day one, it didn't support BitSwap. It didn't support HTTP. Right? And these are there are nodes out there in in Filecoin network that are publishing, um, making deals all the time. So when the BitSwap and HTTP was added, uh, for them to tell the world that hey. All the millions of multi-hashes that I've published over the last, I don't know, few months, now is retrieval over BitSwap. It was a single um, advertisement that was added to the chain, and that is it. Right? That is pretty nice. Reader privacy. We're going to cover that in depth by the talk by Ivan later on today, and we're going to cover uh, what it means for the DHT itself. Um, uh, reader privacy is something that is cross-cutting across uh, multiple content routing systems, and it affects uh, the, pro uh, the, the way by which we exchange information fundamentally, uh, but not necessarily the lookup algorithm itself. So it's, it's quite a, a neat improvement, which is user-centric, and I think it's very welcome. 
We're going, we're going to cover that uh, uh, deeply today. Advertisement mirroring is another new extension in the IPNI. It is yet to be formalized in the, in the specifications. Uh, I'll point you to the specifications later today. Uh, but the main idea there is that uh, for other nodes to provide the same information, uh, if we go back to the previous slide, for other nodes to provide the same information, uh, indexer nodes, they need to have the ground truth. They need to have the advertisement chain. They need to have the entries, right? And it would be a real shame if every time they want that information, they have to go back to the original provider. Because that means that every time uh, IPNI network expands, providers get the punishment of, oh, I have to reserve this again, right? Also, it would be a real shame if, if we are talking about this content address network without CDNs, because Data is immutable, right? It is, this is highly cacheable information, right? So the idea of advertisement mirroring is to provide caches of this chain of uh, advertisements across the network such that it enables, first of all, um, fast uh, catch-up of new indexer nodes to the information, and second of all, lays the foundation for a world uh, in which you can verify uh, and assert that a node actually provides the information they claim, right? Because remember, at the end of the day, what we really, really, really want is for people to find their data and for them to get it, right? Really get what they asked for, okay? We have streaming lookup. So this is a work that started uh, in the HTTP delegated routing uh, by the stewards team, very welcome. Um, basically, all the IPNI APIs now support uh, ndjson um, streaming um, responses back. The way that it works is extremely simple. Rather than having a giant body of JSON which has an array in it that has many, many records, you just write the records with, with new lines separated uh, as soon as you find them. And this is quite powerful, um, um, yet simple. I'll go over the benefits of that in the seed.contact specifically. Uh, but the long story here is that it makes the chaining of this routing systems together much, much uh, easier because uh, you don't have to wait for, because, you know, at the start of the chain, uh, you can trickle the, trickle the information up as you find them rather than having to wait for the aggregate of latency of all these chain systems to get the results back. So it is pretty simple, a pretty fundamental advancement in terms of, making this lookup faster while making it swappable. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll cover this in the context stuff. The lookup that just works, right? So this is another advancement in, in the IPNI protocol. Uh, originally, IPNI was only focused on the information that is explicitly published the way that the IPNI speaks. Uh, this meant that if there was an alternative routing system like BitSwap or the DHDE, you need to go and run your own router, right? You, you go and run your own uh, BitSwap client and find the information, right? Now we are moving towards the world, uh, or we, we have already delivered this, uh, extensions to the IPNI lookup protocol that allows you to specify cascading of lookup. So uh, in the APIs, you can specify to which alternative routing system the lookup should be cascaded and then the aggregated results are returned back to, back to the client. There is this concept of a cascade label, uh, which right now supports two variations, IPFS, DHD, and what we call legacy. Uh, this is the mechanism by which uh, Lassie, for example, uh, delegates the uh, problem of content discovery and content routing to an external system and keeps its system boundaries crisp and firm. Uh, to do one thing very, very well, and that is retrieval. Uh, so this is, this is, I think, an interesting advancement because, uh, again, we, we are keeping ourselves true to this promise of, give me the set, I'll find it for you. Diving a little bit into cascading lookup. Uh, cascading lookup uh, will always return the IPNI information. Uh, so it, it is just a complementary lookup over multiple um, multiple routing systems. Like I mentioned, two ones are supported today. There's a, there's a label that you specify. So literally there is a query parameter called cascade. You uh, add it to the end of the get request for the CID and you 
Insert IPFS hyphen DHD. If you want the legacy, you add another one equals legacy, and that's all you have to do. Uh, these, we have built in a mechanism by which users can discover these labels as they appear, uh, because they, you really shouldn't have to watch the specification or read the specification every time you need to read the system. Uh, we also want to enable programmatic ways by which you can discover these cascading mechanisms. So if you send a HTTP options request to an IPNI uh, node, in the headers you get back uh, two, extra, two extra headers, which is IPNI uh, allow cascade, which contains a comma separated list of those labels that you could specify. That's quite neat. And in the case of legacy, it will tell you how can you, uh, what, where you need to peer in order to make your content discoverable. So le let me talk a little bit about this um, uh, legacy thing. So the context behind this was to enable uh, Project RIA, just make the Project RIA work. Uh, we just want to delegate content discovery. So that's where all this uh, came from. Uh, I have a whole bunch of numbers to present uh, to you in the C. Contact presentation. Uh, but the main thing about the word legacy here is that right now it basically includes BitSwap gossip. And we are very specific about how we are making the BitSwap, um, uh, how we are making the content that is only discoverable over BitSwap available. And that is by explicit peering. So if you're a user, if you're a node out there that, is, that has this content only discoverable over BitSwap for whatever reason, right? You could explicitly peer to an address in IPNI uh, to then make that content discoverable. If you do not, then we won't be going out looking for it. Because remember, BitSwap is in, uh, uh, IPNI is in the ball game of mass discovery, large scale, by the bucket sort of thing. And the uh, uh, BitSwap gossip is not something that scales in that type of environment because it's uh, uh, sort of inefficient by design, right? Streaming responses. So all you need to add to your responses is this accept header application xndjson. Just works. Please give it a try today. Sit that contact. Uh, if you haven't switched to streaming responses, please do. Uh, there's numbers to persuade you some more in the uh, in the Citadel contact uh, presentation. What's on the making in the IPNI roadmap? So we have the pri uh, we plan to make the lookups private by default. Uh, right now we store the information on encrypted uh, on the back end. So you know uh, from from observability perspective, an IPNI instance, for example, could collect. Uh, analytics data on how popular CID is or what a specific user is looking at, right? And that's not great. We really don't want to enable another Google Analytics when we are making Web3 world. Uh, so what we want to do instead is uh, we want to roll out reader privacy, the stuff that Ivan is going to cover. Um, and then what we're going to do is even for the unencrypted advertisements out there, we're going to do the encryption on client's behalf and the, the key store, the value store on, on the back end will only contain encrypted information. So we are, we are making the lookup encrypted by default. As part of that, we're going to optimize the read path. Uh, so, so far, we've done a lot of work in optimizing the write path, i.e. publication of information. We are going to make the read path even faster by the way of uh, leveraging the uh, double hashed information uh, because Double hash information opens the opportunity by which you get the data pre effectively pre-processed. I'll get into that a little bit more later. We want to enable more adoption of IPNI. So what we are looking at is, what does it look like if uh, we want to enable that long tail of content providers to also publish to uh, IPNI? Right? And that long tail is, remember, my laptop on the train going to work and back. How can we reduce, ba uh, reduce uh, barriers of adoption there? And uh, a whole body of work around federation, which has already started with the advertisement mirroring, uh, but uh, we're going to formalize that a little bit more. We're going to have protocols that um, reason about how consistency across multiple uh, IPNI instances can be guaranteed as, follow, as long as they follow the same protocol. So um, this also includes things like caching, for example, uh, as a natural way of reducing trust, uh, the need of trust for a single entry. So exciting stuff coming up. Who is working on this, all this awesome stuff? Uh, we have a team of uh, five. 
four people in this team are in IPNI, uh, IPFS thing today. Um, please reach out to us. Andrew, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today. Um, uh, he's based on uh, West Coast uh, US. Ivan, sitting over there, is going to give us a talk. Yours truly, Torfin, who is the uh, product manager in, in IPNI team. If you're interested or curious about running your own IPNI instance, please come talk to us. Uh, Torfin would love to give you a walkthrough. And we've got Will sitting at, right at the back uh, that um, uh, is basically shepherding all this work uh, th through integration with other systems across the interplanetary network. Uh, we have a brand new uh, GitHub organization, uh, IPNI. This is all things IPNI. Please go and visit it. Uh, we will have a shiny website coming up soon, so uh, look out for that. Uh, there's, if there's one repo you check out in the IPNI uh, organization is specs. We already have three extensions merged. We've got uh, three waiting. Uh, there is an open API HTTP specification for all the APIs that I talked about. You can generate your own client and whatnot. Uh, but if you're looking for changes on the IPNI protocol, that is the repo to watch. And uh, I just wanted to point out the really nice work done by uh, Andrew recently, which consolidated all these little uh, improvements and functionalities into a single uh, reusable Go library called GoLib IPNI that allows you to kind of slice and dice functionalities and sort of build your own client the way you like it. Uh, we would love contributions there. We would love to understand how this looks from the developer experience perspective. So uh, give it a try, and uh, comments are more than welcome. Capture an issue. We are very quick in responding. Uh, there is a CLI to check out uh, the, that allows you to verify interaction in, in IPNI network. For example, have I advertised the right thing as a provider? Has an indexer network seen the information that I've uh, advertised? And uh, this information, uh, this, this CLI allows you to verify these things and actually check that you are an IPNI provider or you know, consumable by an indexer. Uh, it is in, in that repo, please uh, check it out. Two main commands to remember, verify ingest and list add. Uh, these are the commands that are heavily used inside Bedrock, if not the um, PL network, uh, just for testing our own stuff. So these are the tools we have built to make sure that systems work, such as, for example, Boost. Uh, and other providers. There is a new CLI coming up, uh, which looks much, much shinier. Watch out for that. Uh, we have four blog posts that talk about what is IPNI. Uh, that QR code takes you to the latest published by Ivan that walks you through extended providers, but there is more. Please uh, check them out. Uh, and finally, Filecoin Slack IPNI. That's where you find all the uh, uh, community interaction. Uh, please uh, reach out to us uh, if there's anything that we can help you with. Uh, so I'm going to pause for uh, questions and then walk you through sit.contact after that. Uh, how do you guys find that? Any, any questions I can answer? Hey, uh, great work, uh, Masi. So just one question is, uh, in theory, if Kubo nodes start publishing these advertisements, there's nothing stopping from like all that IPFS content getting indexed directly on IPNI, right? Like, could you integrate uh, an IPNI client directly into a Kubo node and start get them to start publishing advertising instead of using the DHT, for example? Absolutely. This exists today. It is actually integrated into Colab IPFS clusters. Uh, the data from Colab IPFS clusters is discoverable on sit.contact right now. And the way that that works is by integrating the index provider library that I pointed to earlier, the main thing to point out there is that the barrier for adoption right now means that you have to uh, have a publicly accessible endpoint for, for advertisements to get fetched, right? And that is okay for long-running IPFS clusters, but if I'm on a train uh, use case, running a publicly accessible thing is not really desirable. So what we want to do is that make that a little bit better. Uh, just talk about what we can do there to enable this long tail of publication. Sorry, just uh, which instance do the Kubo nodes use? So they get to configure which IPNI instance uh, to talk to? Right. So um, there are two ways by which you can announce the IPNI network. One is uh, not directly configured. It works through uh, gossip sub. Uh, so it gets propagated over the network. The other one is explicit HTTP announcements, which goes to sit.contact. I believe Colab clusters are using 
gossip sub, are they? Or are they using direct connection? But anyway, so you have both options, right? Uh, so for example, Filecoin uses the gossip sub thing, and uh, the uh, uh, NFT data storage uses explicit HTTP, which you need an endpoint, right? Thanks, this is great. And it, this might be a question that sort of contextually should be in the CID contact um, uh, pr presentation, but um, what does it take for someone like the average user of Kubo to advertise onto this network right now? Is it Does it happen by default? Are we actually filling um, the IPNI system with the existing um, CIDs out there? Or is there something that the average user has to flip a switch? So um, the lookup side right now, just the, the reading content, is built into Kubo. Uh, you don't have to do anything about that. I think it's enabled by default. But publication, providing content, is not. Uh, what we do have, however, is extensions to the uh, integration layers in, in Kubo, which is uh, HTTP delegated routing, uh, for you to then use that interface to publish information. And that is the very same interface that is used by uh, IPFS Colab clusters to provide information. Uh, in that case, it would become a you know, hands-on keyboard integration of a library. So you don't have to implement everything from scratch. It's just a bit of glue making in terms of connecting things. But eventually, what we would like to look at is just reason about what the world would look like if providing was also man made default uh, behavior that was configurable without the need for implementation, right? But early days there, uh, there is a need for some uh, protocol changes just to reduce barriers for adoption, like I mentioned, but, but we are certainly thinking about it. Like one thing I hear from providers a lot is that they want to only provide the data that uh, their customers are giving them, basically. Um, is that a use case the IPNI is considering? Or? Uh, so uh, what sort of filtering are they exactly looking for? Would you mind repeating that for me? Yeah, so like, like imagine you're a provider and you have customers giving you data to provide, right? You, like, you only want to spend money providing that data and not any other data, right? Absolutely. So uh, filtering is, is, is an interesting topic. This is something that came up in the Boost discussion as well. Um, so right now, so, so I backtrack. When the Boost started, it was all or nothing, right? By default, it always provides everything, right? And then there was a like, call out from community, look, I need to be able to configure this. So right now, there's a specific flag. Uh, you can specify whether a deal information could be published to IPNI or not. Absolutely. Uh, it already exists, but it's on the Filecoin side. Uh, if this is a concern that's big enough, totally, we, we, can, we can certainly introduce it in the IPFS world as well.